Today we have the opportunity to film both a webcast at the Wasatch Reading Summit in Salt Lake City and an episode of the podcast, Podclast. Um, our guest is Dr. Mark Seidenberg, the Vilas Research Professor and Donald O. Hebb Professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Seidenberg. Very glad to be here, Laura. You're a cognitive neuroscientist and author of the book, Language at the Speed of Sight. Did you have any idea that your book was going to have such an impact on the field of language and reading, and why do you think it has? Well, it's a little hard to know that it has, and so I'm glad to hear you say that. You know, you write these things and you put them out into the world, and you don't really know how they penetrate. Um, I wrote the book a bit out of a sense of frustration because I thought that we were missing a lot of opportunities in terms of bringing the science together with educational issues. And, you know, over the years I had been brushed off quite a bit. You, you kind of think that people will be able to get together in the same room and work together towards common goals, but that was not happening. And it was clear that just taking more meetings and talking to people was about possibilities wasn't going to do anything. So I wrote the book to try to move things forward a little bit. Now, uh, some people were very prepared for this message and were very grateful for it and were glad to have me lay out some of the science and then really go into, well, why haven't we made better use of this? And what, what is the history here? And what is this hole we've kind of dug ourselves into? But there are other people who, you know, the book kind of replayed some of the polarization in the field. And so there are other people who won't open it because they already know that it's not actually relevant to what they do. So I'm glad to hear that it's had penetration. I've gotten great responses from a lot of people. I'm really glad to have done it. I'd like to put it in the hands of parents, especially. We've got a reader's guide to it that we're going to just distribute for free to make some of the concepts a little easier to follow. And basically, if it has some positive impact, I'll be just really thrilled. So in your acknowledgments, you thank your mom for allowing you to always be able to pick whatever book you wanted to, and you mentioned that you still have a copy of The Boy Scientist. Yes. Um, did you always know you were going to be a scientist, that you were ever going to be um, working with um, the brain? No, no, I didn't know it at all. I mean, I picked out that book at a young age and it was a little over my head, and then I went back to it eventually, which is actually a kind of interesting thing you can have your kid do. Um, um, no, I wasn't interested in science initially. I, I was more a reading literature kind of person. And um, I was also interested, at a young age, I had a summer job uh, working at a clinical center for children with developmental issues. Uh, this was a high school job, and then later when summers at college. I was dealing with these kids with a variety of pretty serious developmental issues. And so, you know, you see how varied kids' development is, and you see the kinds of things that can happen. They were all from poor backgrounds, and so you could see how difficult it was for them to get help. And I guess I was exposed to, you know, some things that end eventually carried over into the issues we have in reading at a pretty young age. But no, I didn't know that I would be a scientist at all. There was no brain to study back then. I mean, the human brain was very hard to study. We didn't have the tools we have now. And so if you had asked me about it, I, I would never have been able to predict where the science went and how I went along with it. So after decades of research, what has been the most interesting or maybe surprising for you? I think the interesting thing is that it is, reading is complicated. Children vary. Languages are different. Writing systems are different. People learn to read under very different conditions. The issues are extremely complicated, and yet over the past 30, 40 years, there's been a considerable amount of progress in getting to the basic underlying issues. How does reading work? How does it relate to spoken language? How do children learn? What are the kinds of obstacles that occur, devout, can, can, can show up? What are the kinds of things that we can do to get around them? So I feel like I've been one of the people, one of many people in labs that are literally around the world who worked on this enterprise and it actually has been 
one of the better success stories in terms of studying some aspect of human behavior. We understand quite a lot, not everything, but we understand quite a lot. And, and, and the pa even though it's been a topic of research for a long time, the pace of discovery, I think, is accelerating. So uh, I think I couldn't have predicted, for example, that we were going to be making the progress that we're making on conditions that interfere with reading, dyslexia, and other conditions. The way that things have, you know, really um, been moving in the last five to ten years, they, they it, it's just been great to be a part of in some way. It sounds like even after all this time, you're still very fascinated by what you're doing and what you're finding. I am. Some of the research that really is relevant to education, practice, helping kids, and so on, and parents um, and teachers. Uh, it's pretty old now. And so, you know, and sometimes I'm talking about research that the science kind of assimilated quite a long time ago and we've moved on from. But um, I do think I, I am still interested. And there are still really challenging things. You, you do, once in a while, discover that there was something you were missing about some essential part of the problem, like of learning to read or dyslexia. And Suddenly there's this topic to work on and we've got great tools now for trying to go to work on it. So yeah, it is interesting and, and it, again, I think it's part of being, partly because I'm part of this community where other, I can build on other people's work and they can build on mine. So a quote that's been attributed to you a lot is that the reading wars are over and science lost. Could yeah. you comment on that a little bit? Uh, so I'm not in the business of evaluating particular curricula what, what I found was that um, there was this um, period um, in which there was th this opposition between what were supposed to be different approaches, whole language and phonics, though that was the basis for the reading wars. And um, of course, whole language is sort of a philosophy about how to teach kids to read, and phonics is just like one element of another approach. So it was kind of a mismatched comparison. Um, but eventually there was so much research suggesting that essentially kids need to know about print and sound and how they relate and we need to have that built into uh, early learning and early reading curricula. Eventually there was so much research about this and so many people discovering it and so much publicity in, uh, in, in the media that um, educators were forced to respond. And the response that I saw initially was balanced literacy. And balanced literacy was just sort of a slogan which said, use the best of you know, each approach. And that was a way to kind of diffuse the controversy and um, put the criticisms of the whole language approach aside um, because now everyone was just going to use the best of both worlds. And um, it didn't solve any of the underlying issues. Teachers already thought they were using the best of both worlds, and so they didn't have to change anything at all. They just had to relabel what they were doing. Um, since then, so I didn't see that as, a, as helpful to kids. I saw that as a way to diffuse the, um, the uh, controversy and get the scientists to, um, try to try to get the scientists to pull back. The other thing was people shifted their focus from reading uh, to literacy which seems like a really small step because, you know, literacy includes reading and spelling and writing, and basically they're um, similar terms. But when the International Reading Association, for example, changed its name to the International Literacy Association, that actually um, had an effect because people want to be promoting literacy. People want to be have the idea that they are bringing their kids along on this path towards literacy and that mere reading was just kind of construed as the mechanics or something. Mm -hmm. Would you rather be teaching the mechanics or would you be rather be promoting literacy? Again, it's a bogus distinction. But what it, the effect that it had was that all of the science that had called into question the ways that reading was being taught and the kind of curricula that people were using, like whole language, suddenly could be treated as irrelevant because we weren't in the business of teaching reading. We're in the business of promoting literacy. 
That was another way to kind of get the science to go away and to maintain the status quo. So this next question may relate to that. Um, much of the really important research on reading and dyslexia is happening in labs and departments of psychology, not in departments of education. And much of the science never makes it to the teacher in the classroom. So why is that? And do you see that changing? Well, um, departments of education or schools of education are usually big organizations where they have various kinds of responsibilities. There are parts of um, schools of education, large ones, where very good basic research is done. They'll be in departments of educational psychology, for example. But the point is that they're not connected to the curriculum and instruction department or to the programs in um, preparing, for preparing um, students for certification as teachers, teacher training programs. So it's kind of not that there isn't good research in education and some other departments like uh, communicative sciences and disorders where there's a lot of good stuff. Um, uh, now there's good stuff coming in from the use of computer models and so on. There, there's really good research of various sorts. Some of it is housed within education. It's just not connected to teacher training. It's not tr connected to what a future principal or school school administrator or policymaker is going to be. Um, um, it's not connected to their training. Um, why is that? Uh, I think probably because on the teacher education side, people think that it's essentially an art and it's something that you learn by doing. It's kind of discovery learning applied to um, the teaching profession itself. Just like you can't, you don't want to teach children by telling them things or through direct instruction. You can't teach teachers how to teach through by telling them or through teaching them methods or anything like that. They have to discover them in the activity of teaching itself. So this amounts to learning on the job, uh, which is hard. Um, so uh, I don't think that the science is valued. It's never been part of the curriculum. Uh, people really have focused on a number of figures from the past who are just the go-to totemic people like um, Dewey and Montessori and um, uh, a few others um, who um, just will always be the source of the eternal um, verities. And so people don't feel like they have to update um, their information. They have the knowledge that they need um, already. And there isn't high value placed on um, being scientifically literate and being able to not only um, not not so much read the literature, but be able to critically assess what people are claiming, or s be able to ask the right questions about what the research is showing, or be able to read a book like mine, which is you know has a lot of science in it and requires a certain amount of um, background to be able to really fully absorb. So. I just don't think it's been, ever been valued. It goes back a long time. And um, uh, it makes it very hard to get any of this research into teacher preparation, curriculum development, and so on. Will it happen in the future? It hasn't happened in the past. I think it's more likely that innovations will happen at perhaps the smaller sorts of schools where teacher education training people, preparing people for the job of teaching is important. Some of the smaller state colleges, for example, where um, unlike the big, grand, top-rated universities, they, they don't have ratings to protect, and they don't have sort of vested interests in the status quo. Perhaps some innovation will come out of that. Perhaps some philanthropists or funding agencies from the government will make it possible to develop some new models for um, bringing people into a, the teaching field and preparing them for the job so they can do the job they, they really want to do. Uh, I don't know. It's hard to predict. So even with the, our NAEP scores and our PISA scores that are pretty atrocious, um, it looks like the average teacher will probably still have to rely on either some program or curriculum um, and will devote a lot of time and money to professional development to try and learn 
what they need to be effective in the classroom? Yes, I, I think a couple of things are, are going on. Again, it's a, it's a big country and there are a lot of programs and so there are going to be some exceptions, although not that many. Um, one thing that seems to be happening is the, the schools of education have been really resistant to change for a very long time. It is not like there's someone is going to suddenly say, yep, we really could benefit from incorporating more of this work. Can we talk about how we could develop a curriculum that makes use of your science and our educational expertise and really builds a great program for our students? I don't think that's going to happen. Um, if the teachers don't get better training, then one possibility is that we'll end up relying much more on software. I mean, we'll end up having, you know, um, the software that's put out by the, sold by the big educational corporations, um, which will take over some of the day-to-day -day instructional activities, and the teachers will be, um, uh, to the teacher's position will not, the skills required for the teacher's position aren't going to increase. They might actually even decrease because now there's this other tool that they can rely on. Teacher's responsibility might be the social and development of the child and emotional development of the child more so than actually reading and math and thinking and things like that. I, I wouldn't want to predict the future, but I don't see the schools of education changing. And there certainly are um, other possibilities now that actually um, can are expensive though they may be, uh, and uh, that can be relied upon possibly further demeaning the role of the teacher, which is, would be a shame. Well, that kind of leads to this too, which is educators and parents spend a lot of time trying to find what works for struggling readers. Um, could you talk about a bit, a bit about the What Works Clearinghouse and the reality of its usefulness in identifying really what works? Sure. So we, we could all use solid information that would help us get through the thicket of programs that are out there. There are many kinds of programs developed by many different kinds of individuals and corporations and so on. And how's a person to know what's actually um, got a scientific basis or has been shown to be effective or not? So the What Works Clearinghouse was supposed to serve that function. And it was created as part of No Child Left Behind. And um, you can go to this site and you can see programs that have met the criteria that the What Works people thought applied to deciding whether a program had a, a, a solid um, evidence base. The problem is they it hasn't actually worked very well, and it's not a particularly um, reliable source. One thing is that they decided to model it on uh, medical research where randomized controlled trials are really the gold standard, and so for deciding, for example, whether a new drug is effective or not, or another, some kind of new treatment is. Um, randomized controlled trials in education are not very common because they're expensive, they're difficult to run, and we don't have funding agencies who will support these things in the way that, for example, the pharmaceutical industry supports randomized control trials on new med medications. So uh, there aren't, what that meant was that the what Works Clearinghouse was not considering most of the research that's been done in the field they narrowed themselves down to studies that had a particular methodology. There aren't enough of them to really um, do the job, give us the information we need. And moreover, often the ones that are done are done by people who are not at arm's distance from the, a product that they might be selling. So um, you have conflicts of interest where the only studies that actually showed that the um, program worked were conducted by people who had a vested interest in the product that's being sold. There may be other repositories, archives, uh, websites that serve this purpose better coming along. Uh, we certainly need it because, you know, anyone can market a, 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 a curriculum for first and second and third grade reading. And, um, 
sound good, maybe have a good story, and yet we wouldn't really know that it's effective because it hasn't actually been tested properly. So we need this. Uh, it's what works should have done the job, but it hasn't. So let's focus on some solutions. <laughs> um, could you discuss the Flexner report? Uh, you mentioned that in the book um, as a possible model for change. Yes, yeah, so the Flexner report was in the early 20th century, and it was um, essentially a review of the practices that were in place at programs that were training physicians in that era, late 19th century, early 20th century. And at that point, medical education was nothing like it is today. Uh, it, there were private, anybody could get into the business, uh, the training didn't have a scientific basis, and um, essentially it wasn't very good. And Flexner wrote a scathing report about it, and um, both documenting what was wrong with how physicians were being trained, but also he synthesized developments that were going on at a few universities at the time, Johns Hopkins, Harvard, and a few others, where they were developing a new model for how to train medical professionals. So Flexner both critiqued the existing medical schools and he presented this model for medical education, which is still, which revolutionized medical education, changed it into something that's very much like we have today, which is a combination of classes, instruction, and hands-on activity um, that is guided by um, advanced um, skilled professionals. Um, so the Flexner Report is an example of how a profession came into being. Medicine became a, 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 a profession be, because the Flexner Report had such enormous impact. The question I raised in the book was whether something could happen, something like that could happen in education. Someone could lay out a better plan for how to prepare people for education, how to bring good people into education, how to support them during their education, and then when they make the transition into a professional setting. Um, I don't actually think it's realistic at all, because uh, in you know the turn of the 20th century, those existing medical schools were not very good, they weren't very successful, and when a better model for how to do it came along, the universities, which had a certain amount of power, influence, and, and um, funding, um, could build new programs, and the old ones disappeared. That situation we have right now is very different. We have schools of education that are very well established. Um, many, of the, I think the people think they're doing a good job. People want to think they're doing a good job. They don't think that the problems that we see in education are due to any due to them. They see them as due to societal problems like poverty. And so it's not a situation where if you present a new model, suddenly there, there's just too, too many entrenched interests that are too powerful to just um, imagine that they're going to change overnight in the way that medical education really did change almost overnight in the US. I don't think that's a model that's going to work. Something a little less revolutionary is going to have to be, um, a little more incremental might be the approach rather than just trying to whole, trying for wholesale change. So let's talk about that. If you could make recommendations based on your perspective and what you've seen, um, what you know works, what recommendations or suggestions could you make incrementally that would move the dial on reading achievement in the US? Well, I can certainly imagine building programs that are better. It would require funding. Uh, it would require, um, for example, a program that went into a little bit more depth about the science in addition to dealing with the education side in more depth. Um, might take longer for a student to get through. That's going to mean there's tuition and other expenses. Perhaps there is some philanthropist or some other way to make it so that getting be better training isn't a financial burden. Um, I would certainly lean on universities to make sure that this, try to 
overcome these gaps, these separation, the chasm between education and science, um, some top-down influence on getting the relevant parties to cooperate on programs that would be um, beneficial uh, to, would, would, would be helpful. Um, and if that were done in perhaps a few places and successful, um, maybe that would cause other dominoes to fall. Um, I, I do think that um, a lot of attention focuses on things to do with teachers in, ser in service, in service training. Um, and that can be very good. Again, teachers have to be incentivized. They have to realize why it's relevant, why it's important to do. It can't be something that comes at great cost to them. Um, and, um, you know, or many organizations try to bring educators together to give them um, updated information and so on. Maybe we could do that on a grander scale. Uh, it's hard. Um, uh, you know, there are groups that are trying to work from the bottom up to change attitudes and to spread information. And I, I do think information knowledge is good and that if it can, it can indeed have an impact, especially if it's coming from the practitioners, the parents, the people who are on the front lines and not just coming from the top down. Um, beyond that, I think it's really a pretty deep hole. And so I would really, um, uh, like to see some broader changes in education, which would include tra teacher training, but also how education is funded, how we deal with kids from lower income backgrounds who don't have the same opportunity and so on. I don't have an instant solution. I do think there's a lot of information to capitalize on, and I think there are people who are interested, um, perhaps people knowing that there are other people who share their attitudes and beliefs and goals um, would allow us to get a critical mass uh, together to make things happen a little more quickly. Well, you mentioned money, and I just wonder if, you know, the money that the Gates Foundation and um, Chan Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg has been really pouring into education um, is directed in the right, at the right point. Well, it's clear that there are places that funding would could be directed that would be very helpful. Now, those particular foundations support some kinds of projects that are quite interesting. Uh, uh, Zuckerberg, in particular, is funding some basic research. But um, I don't know. It might be that training teachers or preparing people for education, careers in education, which is the way I prefer to think of it, um, it's just not glamorous enough for philanthropy, you know. Uh, it, it is certainly a place where an influx of funding um, would be helpful, but it, it also, there have to be changes on the job, right? We have many states where um, teachers are underpaid, uh, in my state, Wisconsin, they were demonized as part-time employees and uh, had cutbacks in their um, health and benefit, health care and benefits. Um, and, you know, if we can improve things on the training side, but it's going to be for naught if nobody wants to go into the jobs that, as they're now construed. So. Um, it's going to take movement on several fronts that's coordinated. And I, again, I think if it happened on a small, rel, even a modest scale in a few locations and was highly successful, that would be a really good start because there would be models for how to do things. And then we could really confront how, how committed we are to change because we'd see that there are these things that can be done. Dr. Seidenberg, thank you for your time and your willingness to share your expertise. I've been very glad to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks.